We are continuing our series in um, being the church, being the church. And uh, being the church is more than a location you attend on a Sunday. It's more than a set of rules that you subscribe to. Being the church is essentially three things. First of all, it's relational, a relationship with God and others. Secondly, it's missional. They're not just here to huddle up and hide out until things are concluded. There's a mission that we're on. And thirdly, it's invitational, that, that we're not just here to be by ourselves, but to invite others to be with us. And we've been walking through the book of Acts and seeing how this gets lived out week after week. Now, something that we're going to look at today was about to change in the church with that would be the biggest significant adjustment in the history of the church up to that point. And it wouldn't be possible if they kept their traditions. And here's the thing about traditions. We all have them. Say, well, I'm anti-tradition. Then that's your tradition. <laughs> you kind of fit in that category. That, that's who you are. All right. One of the challenging things about the season that we're in right now is that our inability to practice our traditions the way we typically do has been frustrating and disappointing to us. So like when you head into holiday seasons and, and we've got the, the COVID challenges that we're facing, I hear people say things like this. Well, if we're not able to do this, then it just won't be, and then whatever it is, Easter or Christmas or Thanksgiving. Or, and it's really interesting thing that, that the, the routines through which we navigate those events are important to us. And it's, it's shared memory. It, it identifies, it, it helps us recall some things that have occurred. We, we look forward many times to those things. So we're in a season right now where that's not as big an option and people feel like these things are less. The church was faced with a situation like this in the book of Acts where there were some things that if the kingdom of God was going to expand globally, there were some th traditions some practices, some things that they enjoyed, some things that they thought were very important that were going to have to change. And if they were unwilling to do that, then the church would be restricted. So we're in Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 23. The next day, Peter started out with them. We'll find out who them is in just a couple minutes. And some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived at Caesarea, Cornelius, and if you don't know who he is, he's a European military person, was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law, it's against our traditions for a Jew to associate or visit with a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour, three in the afternoon, suddenly... A man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. I think that, that verse could be really powerful in the culture in which we live. God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. 
We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God uh, had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message, and the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. I'm sure at some point in your life you've had an occasion, and maybe a lot more than that, to feel excluded, to feel left out. It can happen socially. We just don't get invited to something. It can happen emotionally. People seem to open up more to others than they do to us. It can happen spiritually, where we feel as though that maybe God does show favors to some people and does more in and through their lives or for their lives than he does for us. And if you've ever felt excluded, you know it's a really uncomfortable feeling. And here's the challenge. It's so uncomfortable that we will actually position ourselves in life to avoid occasions in which we might be excluded. And here's the thing I want you to see, is that that strategy protects your feelings at the cost of your future. Do not sacrifice your future for your feelings. You will never find all God has for you by only responding to the feelings you prefer. There's just some things we got to lean into, some things we've got to walk into, and it's not comfortable. We don't feel prepared. We're uncertain. And if all we do is the things we're most comfortable with, we will wind up in places that we actually don't prefer. So Jesus has actually come to break down those barriers that we build between us and others. And he's also come to build up the things that are broken down in us. This is what Jesus does for us. So we're introduced to a guy whose name is Cornelius. And what we know is uh, he was a uh, Roman and he was uh, a military person. And we know three things about him that scripture revealed in the text we read today. First, he lived honorably. It, it identified him as a God-fearer. That's a very specific term. And what it means is that he had, as best he could, tried to understand the values that God wanted people to live by and tried to live up to those values as consistently as he possibly could. He wasn't an individual that just said, if, if I'm going to believe in a God, God has to accept me on whatever terms I decide. He decided that whatever terms God has, that's what I want to try to strive for. And uh, in our culture, there's a lot of frustration and built around that because people assume that um, somehow God is opposed to them if God doesn't agree with something that they do or don't do. And what I want you to know is that uh, the rules that God has established in his word are not about trying to hinder or restrict life. It helps us actually experience life to the full. And so this person lived honorably, but secondly, he also gave generously. And that's an interesting thing because for a Roman in that time, you never gave gifts to the poor. And that's what it said he did. His alms to the poor, his gifts to the poor were recognized by God. The reason you didn't do that is because you always took whatever gifts you were able to give and you gave them to someone who was over you, either politically, militarily, financially, uh, socially. You always gave up to someone else in hopes that that would ingratiate you to them and they would open doors of opportunity. The purpose of giving was to get ahead. 
And anyone in that culture that gave to the poor was considered weak or confused or crazy. And so this is a guy who's very countercultural. He's trying to live up to standards that are not part of culture. He's also giving to people who can't benefit, he can't benefit from in any way. And then the third thing it says is that he prayed regularly. So he wants to have uh, direction and, and, and connection with God, and he's willing to do that on a regular and daily basis. And so this is what Scripture says. It says, God noticed Cornelius. Cornelius got God's attention. And this is one of the biggest challenges for us to think about because lots of people think that's what our goal should be, to get God's attention. God's attention is not the same thing as God's salvation. It's not the same. That we can do good things and God notices, but that's not the same thing as those good things are good enough. This is the great struggle that people have. We all want to believe that I might not be perfect, but I'm good enough. And God didn't send Jesus to die on a cross just to kind of help us out and we were already good enough. He came to rescue us because we couldn't be good enough no matter how hard we tried. And so... God notices Cornelius, but that's not the same thing. So Peter is back in Joppa, and he's praying, and he gets hungry. Aren't you glad that uh, uh, you can be doing a spiritual thing and still get hungry? How many since I've started talking, you've already started getting hungry? And yeah, it's just kind of how that works. And while he's waiting for the food to be prepared, he has a vision. And a vision is a picture that he sees. Um, and the picture that he sees, the reason God does that sometimes is that, well, we have an expression, right? A picture's worth a thousand words. That there are things that God can show us in a, in a picture of something that we haven't noticed or understood before. And the picture that he sees is of a giant sheet. It's like a big canvas that's coming down, and it's filled full of animals. And some of those animals, according to the tradition of the Jews, are not allowed to be eaten. For example, pork is not an option if you were raised Orthodox Jew. So the idea that you would have a BLT, it would just be an LT. That's all. No, no B. I'll have a BLT minus the B. That's what it would be, right? But... There's all these animals that are considered not appropriate to eat by the traditions of the Jews. And then God tells Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And Peter says, no. I don't eat unclean things. And God's response is, do not call something unclean that I have cleansed picture disappears. Picture comes back again, second time. Big canvas comes down, animals again, same voice, same command, get up, kill, eat. And this time Peter says, no. Who tells God no twice? Everybody. In that moment, his loyalty is to the traditions that he's been raised with. And it's higher to him than obeying God. And God just gives him the information again. Do not call unclean what I have cleansed. Third time. He sees the picture again. Big canvas comes down. And then the command again. Rise, kill, eat. Peter refused two times because that's how entrenched his thinking was on this issue. The greater question should be, if, if God tells us to do something, under what scenario would we choose not to be obedient? So right after the vision is over, there's a knock on the door. And this is interesting to me, is that it is often true that after God gives you an insight, he will provide an opportunity very shortly after for you to respond to something that he just showed you. And it's amazing how many times we'll, we'll have the insight, but we won't walk out the door 
and actually follow through on something. So there's a knock on the door, and the Spirit just speaks to Peter and said, there's some people, and you're to go with them, and you're not to ask any questions. You just go along. The Spirit did that because he knew Peter would hesitate. I think that in life there's, there's three great connections, and the first connection is to God. Uh, a lot of life isn't going to make sense for us if all we do is just live for whatever the the cultural norms and values call to our attention. So in Western culture, modern culture, that has a lot to do with how much you make, what title you possess, what your occupation or vocation is, those kind of where you live, what you wear. And what I can tell you is uh, we, we have now experienced a culture whose houses are full and our souls are empty. It's just something's not working. So connection to God. And then a connection with others that... This isn't about a personality. Some, some people are extroverts, some people are introverts. Let's just check, how many people think you're an extrovert? <laughs> the extroverts always raise their hands. And then if I ask how many people think they're introverts, they won't do it. They just, no, I, 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 I'm not calling attention to myself and I don't want God to ex accidentally think I'm volunteering for something, so. So, a connection to others. This is not about personality. You are not designed or created to navigate life in isolation. And if you try it, it will not go well for you. And then the third thing is the connection to your purpose. Because just surviving or maybe even doing well enough to have more than you need is not enough for us. That our Emotional, spiritual capacities don't hold up well when it seems like a lot of what we do has no meaning. We need a purpose. Now, here's the, the downside of these three great connections. Every single one of them require you to take some risk. Every one of them. If you are not a follower of God, you're not even sure if you believe in God, for you to begin a spiritual journey is going to feel a little bit risky for you. If you're a person who doesn't make friends fast and famously, it's going to feel like a little bit of an adventure for you to reach out and make some connections. And if you want to find your purpose, there's always the risk that what you're doing isn't working and, and you learn something about yourself maybe you didn't want to know. We are called to take that risk. And without it, life doesn't work. For example, connecting with others I mean, it is really hard. It is really hard to, to, make, to risk that connection when you're not sure what the response is going to be. I mentioned earlier I officiated a wedding yesterday. I can tell you somebody broke the ice in that relationship. I'm not sure who, but somebody said something to somebody. They didn't just show up on that day and happen to both be at the lake on a gorgeous day wearing wedding clothes and found somebody. That's not how it works. Somebody had to open up. And here's the thing. We tend to hold back until we have some clues that someone already likes or loves us. Scripture tells us that God loves us first, and that's why we love him. And some people think that that's the pattern he's establishing. It's not. That's the pattern he's destroying in us. If all we do is wait for someone else to love us first, we're going to miss out on a lot of love and a lot of life. Because God already loves us, and we know that he loves us, that gives us a little more latitude to risk maybe finding out someone else doesn't love us quite as much as we had hoped. If we keep holding back, we develop kind of a paradigm of rejection. And here's the thing about rejection. Once you have that lens on, you will interpret almost everything in your life as rejection by someone. And it's a suffocating way to live. So there's two stories, two characters in this story I'd like to identify first as a, an outsider and secondly as an insider. And here's what I would tell you about the Outsider. If you're an outsider, you need to risk, you need to risk making a connection. And I know that's really frustrating for lots of people to hear. Because what we want is for someone else to do that work for us. We just, we just want to go somewhere where we just feel like we belong. And I don't know how you find that without some risk. 
You have to be willing to make a connection. So it's, this isn't a personality thing. You could be introverted, you could be shy, you could be a little bit withdrawn, you, all of those things. All of those things can be true, and yet you have to intentionally try to make connections in your life because if you don't, your world just keeps getting smaller and smaller, and there's, there's no way for that to happen without having incredible effects on our internal soul. And so we have to be willing to try. That's, that's what... This is what Cornelius does. He risks make. he sends someone. Go bring Peter in. Let's see what happens. If you're an insider, the risk is to make an invitation. And this isn't so much about refusing to make an invitation. It's just that when you're an insider and you're enjoying all the wonderful things that's happening inside, it's hard to notice people who aren't inside yet. And Peter's an insider. He's never going to accidentally come across Cornelius. But God arranged for them to have a meeting. So how do you demonstrate, how do you extend an invitation? What do you do? Something as simple as closing distance between you and another person. I know we have to keep six feet, but the truth is for a lot of people, we keep a lot more feet distance than that. Moving towards someone can be a really big deal just listening to something that they want to share. I forget who told me, but I thought it was really wise advice. If you want to be interesting, be interested. Learn to listen. Move towards others. Now, showing value to someone who is not an insider is not a cultural norm. Our culture is getting more and more uncomfortable with talking to anyone who's different than us. We would rather be with people who are like us than people who are near us. And here's the thing, I, I get it. It makes conversations way easier, maybe not as interesting, but way easier. But, but here's the thing, there's nobody who thinks exactly like you. There's nobody who thinks exactly like me. I've been married for 34 years. I do not think like my wife and she does not think like me. We have two children. Neither one of them have ever thought like us. If I go back in time five years, I don't even think like I thought five years ago. It's a fool's errand to keep looking for people who are just like me. What if God were putting people near you for a reason? But the tendency is I would rather be by myself than go out of my way. And that's the risk of the insider. We have to extend the invitation. So what brings us all together then? And I can tell you it's not politics. I think we've learned that this week. Um, it's not food. Because there are some things that, that people like and some people, uh, some things that people dislike. Let, let's just check how many like hot and spicy food. Yeah. How many do not like, like hot and spicy food? Yeah, so we got people in both camps. So what are we supposed to do food-wise? And, and this is what people think. Well, they don't have to put hot and spicy on everything. Okay. Our food isn't going to bring us together. Our politics isn't going to bring us together. Our preference in music isn't going to bring us together. Literature won't bring us together. All of these things can be interesting conversations, but we don't have a common denominator with them. What is our common denominator? Our common denominator is Jesus. Jesus is the common ground we all stand on because Jesus came because none of us were good enough. Christianity doesn't look down our nose at anyone, ever, because we all know I was never good enough. I could never be good enough. If God didn't send his son, I would be lost forever. And he did that for me, and what he did for me, he will do for anyone. That's the common ground. That's the common ground. So Peter preaches Jesus in the house of Cornelius. And when he preaches Jesus, he sees himself and he sees others differently. 
any starting point other than Jesus just creates a sense of competition and a lot of opportunity for misunderstanding. So, the same thing that happened on the day of the apostles when they were filled with the Holy Spirit happened at Cornelius' house. They all began to speak languages that they hadn't learned. And this was quite startling to the believers who were there that had accompanied Peter. And Peter said, I can't prohibit baptizing in water when God has baptized in the Spirit. And so they started baptizing the followers, the new followers of Jesus in water. When you look at Cornelius, he is quite a different character. This is the beginning of Gentiles being brought into the kingdom of God. He's Roman. Uh, back in that part of the world at that time, there was a lot of political strife against Rome because they had occupied that territory. His ethnicity is different than a lot of the people around him. And so it would be really easy to think of, and, and this is real important, I, I, I need you to really think about this seriously for a minute. It'd be really easy to think what we need is for our culture to look like this. And this is what I will tell you, whatever picture you have of that is actually tied to your traditions. It's what you're most comfortable with and it's what you wish you had. But Jesus has not come to replace our culture. I'm going to say that again. Jesus has not come to replace our culture. Jesus has come to repurpose us in our culture. Lots of people, their whole view of spirituality is, if I can get the world to look like what I prefer, then I will know Jesus is in control. Just think about that for a minute. God has called to repurpose you. This man has not changed his ethnicity. This man is still going to be a military officer in the Roman military. That's not, none of that is going to change. What is changed is that his purpose in what he's doing is different now. He's been repurposed. Conversion has a lot to do with God assigning new purpose. Now, can culture change? Yes, but if that's our goal, we will always tie it to our traditions. If our goal is to be repurposed by Christ in our culture, it's amazing what doors he will open. Now, in our world, uh, we're told that we should be tolerant of one another, and tolerance is listed as one of the high virtues and high values. And what I can tell you is, uh, it's a cheap substitute because no one wants to just be tolerated. Something else needs to happen. And that's what Jesus has come to do. So, if you sense God is working in you about some of these things, I'd like you to assume something. Assume that God is also working in someone else. Peter could have thought, this is just a thing God is dealing with me. Cornelius could have thought that too. But because they were willing to make a connection, they discovered that God was actually working in someone else too. Let's bow our heads this morning. So I, I always run a risk when I talk about things like this. First of all, it can, be, it can appear as though this is some kind of response to political tensions in our culture. Um, I think you know me well enough to know that um, while I'm a politically interested person, I actually don't feel called to try to bring some difference in our world politically. I think that grace is what actually transforms our lives. And so it's really easy to hear a talk like this and just go, well, you know, so we've been through this season and this is the response. It's always been this season in our world. It's always been this season in our world. There are always been people who exclude others. There are always been people who favor traditions over invitations. There are always people, it's, the, it's human nature, it's what we automatically do. And grace has broken into our worlds 
to break down the barriers between us and others and to build up the places that have been broken down so that we can have a different way to interact. Not based on whether you do what I like or I do what you like, but based on the fact that someone loved us enough to give his life for us. And that changes everything. All the other efforts, as well-intended as they are, and as much good as they might do, always fall short. And so we've come today to the common ground of the grace of God shown to us in the cross of Christ. And anything less than that always leaves us less. So Father, we know we've got your attention. Will you get our attention today? For those of us who struggle with feeling excluded, will you help us find the courage and the faith to try to make a connection? And if it doesn't work, to keep trying. And for those of us who are kind of inside and enjoying the benefits, will you open our eyes to see someone who is a little bit further away and left out? Will you help us risk, whether we're insiders or outsiders, so that your will can be done? Help us choose obedience to you over our preferences or our traditions. In Jesus' name.